Hello, my name is Paul Gilbert, and I'm delighted to welcome Edward Rutsch to our interviews on creating a compassionate world. It's a great privilege to interview him because he's one of the leading founders of developing compassion training. And as we will hear, he has a real interest in developing international training online. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about him. So Edwin is the founding director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. The Center's website, cultureofempathy.com, is the internet's most comprehensive portal for empathy-related material. It hosts many empathy-building projects, including interviews with over 300 experts on the topic, trainings, and the empathy tent. The tent goes to public events and offers listening, facilitated dialogue, and conflict mediation. Edwin is a world traveler, a seeker, a documentary filmmaker, and has worked in the computer technology field. His focus now is on developing an online empathy circle facilitation training course with a massive open online course. For his experience, from his experience, the empathy circle process is the most effective gateway and first step practice for learning, practicing, and deepening empathic listening skills and a mindset. The center is looking for collaborators to design and host the training. Edwin, welcome, and thank you so much for coming to talk to us about this really important area of empathy, and we can look at how it links to compassion later. But to start with, so tell us, how did you get empathy, interested in, in empathy? What sort of led you into the, into the field? Yeah, well, thanks uh, for having me on your show, uh, Paul. It's a pleasure to talk with you. And yeah, how did I get into empathy, which has become uh, almost a calling uh, at the present? It's like everything I do is uh, working on, on this topic to create a more empathic society. And uh, I think, yeah, to start with it, I grew up here in Sacramento, California. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area now. And I grew up in a conservative uh, evangelical uh, family. Uh, but after high school, I had sort of a, a seeker uh, interest, you know, to be a, you know, have maybe read uh, Siddhartha, you know, the Buddhist, uh, the search for meaning. So I took off and traveled around the world for about 10 years. And I uh, just wanted to learn by doing instead of uh, sort of doing, you know, going to college it, 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 to begin with. I just wanted to learn by practical experience by putting myself into different situations with uh, different people. And so I, you know, worked my way around the world, New Zealand, Australia, Indonesia, you know, had different jobs. I was a filmmaker, a, a, a an extra in the movie Apocalypse Now. So <laughs> uh, I was a, a longshoreman in the harbor of uh, Germany uh, in Hamburg, uh, picked fruit in Australia and worked as a kitchen hand in, in a hospital in New Zealand and worked in the outback as a surveyor's assistant in, uh, in Australia, taught English in, in Indonesia, just kind of worked my way around the world. And it was really from all those, uh, you know, just meeting people, living with people all over the world that I just kind of dropped sort of my religious, you know, evangelical or conservative uh, background and just started seeing that it's really about the humanity of everyone. Wherever I went, I could just really connect uh, with people and that uh, their values and the, the connection between people is what was really important. So with that, um, so that understanding kind of uh, that I had developed, uh, then I ended up getting into the computer technology field here in Silicon Valley, but I was still interested in the humanities. So I started uh, making some documentaries about different human values and came across the value of, of empathy. And I said, wow, this is really what I'd been seeking for. It's how we make connections with each other and that empathy is this gateway uh, for, doing, for doing that. So uh, I started doing more work around empathy and it was around that time that the, a little bit after that, Barack Obama was running for office uh, and he said, hey, the country has an empathy deficit. And you know, he talked about it over and over again. I said, yeah, I can kind of help with that. And just started applying myself uh, to the topic, interviewing people, 
and just found that it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's almost like a calling. It's like, I wish I would have discovered this 40 years earlier. <laughs> you know, I lost, you know, 30 years where I could have been working on this topic. So, so that's, that brought me to the point now where I just see that the empathy is this core foundational value of how people really connect with each other, how they see each other. And, uh, so I've been just trying to get the word out about that and, uh, promote it in any way that I can. That's that's fantastic. I mean, I, you say um, you wish you'd seen it 40 years earlier, but then you wouldn't have had those experiences. And it sounds like all those experiences uh, working in a variety of cultures, with a variety of different people, a variety of different values, that seems to have stimulated this interest in understanding what it is about humans, you know, what is it that helps us to relate? And uh, so it sounds like they were quite informative to you in posing these questions. How do we relate? Yeah, I, I guess I had to go through that phase, really, to, to connect with people, you know, to, to sit with uh, Australian Aborigines out in the outback, you know, sitting, camping out with them or being in, in Bali and hanging out with, uh, with fishermen on, on the uh, shore there, as I remember, I I'd bought a little outrigger canoe uh, in northern Bali and sailed around uh, northern Bali and I'd pull into shore and at night and just sit with the fishermen, you know, speaking uh, with them just about life or whatever. And uh, so I guess maybe I just had to go through that that uh, phase. Yeah, exactly. It also sounds like you have this real deep natural curiosity about the other, the you know, the, the, the other person that you're relating to. And I suppose that is also part of what you see as empathy, the need to have this curiosity, to have an interest in the mind of the other. Yeah, there, that, there is a, a curiosity there. It's like, what, what's sort of beyond the horizon uh, and the, the joy of, of discovering that and ex exploring that. And uh, I think it was, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I read a lot of adventure books, uh, Jack London, you know, and he, he would go to Alaska or, you know, had different books about travel. And and so that, that really kind of stimulated me to kind of go beyond, right, to beyond where you are to see uh, beyond that. And I think that does tie in with uh, empathy, because with empathy, we we start seeing who the other person is. Uh, we see deeper into uh, who they are, uh, their values, their feelings, their, their life struggle and uh, there, there is something kind of beautiful about that. It's, it's very enriching, and that, that's what I really appreciate. Or one of the things I value about empathy is that uh, it just is a is a way of enriching uh, my life when I connect with people all over the world through these empathic dialogues. Yeah, I mean, as you know, because we've spoken about this uh, previously about the importance of motivation. What is it that you think motivate? I mean, you have a, a wonderful interest in humanity and you, you know, your life travels says a lot about the fact you have a real natural curiosity. So how can we motivate people to have a curiosity about the other, to take an interest in the other? Because I guess until you have that motivation, empathy may not follow. Yeah, I know you've talked a lot about motivation and how do you really uh, motivate uh people and how do we motivate the society to be more interested in empathy and, and compassion yeah, and yeah, yeah 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 so my own motivation uh i think it's that sense of adventure kind of the newness there's a, a richness and aliveness that that happens and that's a a feeling that's a, a pleasant uh feeling is as well as the sense of uh connection too uh, i I know when you talk about uh, compassion, you talk about the affiliative uh, uh, feeling, and that's a feeling of, of connection. And that feeling of connection feels good versus uh, feeling alone, uh, feeling disconnected. You know, that, there's a, a pain in, in that. And when you're connecting with people, dialoguing with them, sharing with them, uh, becoming more uh, intimate, more real, more open, that there's a, it's a pleasant uh, feeling, that sense of, of connection and, and the warmth that, that comes out of that uh, as well. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, isn't it? So, I mean, 
one of the things that strikes me is because I know you're very interested in empathy training, right? So we, as you, you know, your website makes clear that people may have a degree of natural empathy, but really training, learning to be an empathic listener and, and have this natural curiosity, you can train people for that. And maybe we need to do more of that with our children in our schools because we live in very competitive societies and competitive motors are not really that interested in the other person unless you can get advantage of them yeah so that i agree with that too that's um the you know i the the work that uh i'm doing on empathy i would say the roots of that is with uh, carl rogers who you're probably very well aware of as a, as a therapist and that uh, he used he sort of developed the empathic listening process within the therapeutic uh context and uh, he would just listen to his clients. And it was that listening uh, process that really um, helped them to grow and kind of work through their, uh, their issues. And uh, so that's sort of the foundation of that listening uh, practice of, yeah. you know, for me, empathy is just a, a deep form of listening and being sensitive to the felt experience of, of others. And I think that, 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 that really builds relationships. And like you're saying, and I, I think it really needs to be part of the schools uh, to, to uh, for children. I mean, already, like I've done empathy, you know, circles, but which is a process uh, we use the mutual empathic listening with my nephews and nieces and they're five and six, seven years old, and they can already do it at, at that age. So uh, learning those uh, relational skills, I think would be, you know, really important to bring that into the schools and in fact some of the work that we're doing i remember someone was mentioning that in canada they're they're working with children you know with the empathy uh, empathic listening and uh this woman she would with this with her students young kids you know five six seven she would just listen to them doing active listening empathic listening and uh the empathy circle is mutual empathic listening like i share for a while uh, you reflect back what, what you're hearing me say till I feel heard to my satisfaction. Then you speak and then I reflect back what you're saying. And it's a it's a relational back and forth, uh, you know, deep listening. And so the way she started with these children is she just listened to them. So, you know, tell me what's going on for you. She listened and she listened to another one and listened to another one. And then after a while, they said, we want to do the listening, too. <laughs> So they enjoyed it so much that they then actually asked that they could be listening uh, to, to her and make it a mutual uh, listening. And then after they had done that a while, they said, oh, we want to take this home to our families. So, which I, I got pretty jazzed about hearing that. It's like, yeah, I can, I can just imagine these children, you know, taking empathic listening home to their families and doing uh, family empathy circles. So. Uh, it, it definitely yeah, needs to get into the schools. Yeah, so uh, you've raised this issue, this topic of empathy circles and empathy training. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what that involves, because you've developed that in quite substantial ways. I know you have a, a course, an online course that people can sign up to if they go onto your website. So what are, what are these empathy circles? What do you actually do? Well, as I was mentioning, Carl Rogers, that, uh, you know, when he developed the empathic listening or active listening process within the therapeutic context. So he is a therapist. Uh, we just listen to his clients for the hour. Uh, he would listen and then they would share what was sort of going on for them uh, in sort of in a non-directive way. He wouldn't tell them what they were supposed to talk about. He says, you know, just tell me what's what's on your mind. And then he would periodically reflect back his understanding of what the, his clients were saying, just saying, yeah, did I understand you correctly? I'm, I'm here to accompany, accompany you on your journey uh, to explore you know, what's going on in, in your life, maybe any issues, any problems. And he used to show that he was being attentive and really trying to understand. He would reflect back his understanding and that's within the client uh, therapist context, which is very well known within therapy. It's sort of the core of the therapeutic uh, process. And uh, there's a lot, a lot of different therapeutic process. And I'd say it's pretty core to most, if not all of them. And just what we're doing is taking 
that active listening or empathic listening out of the context of the client therapist relationship and just bring using that process for just relationships, human beings uh, dialoguing uh, with each other more effectively. So we have maybe four or five people in what we call an empathy circle. We have maybe a topic or you can talk about whatever's alive for you. Uh, one person is the speaker. They select who they're going to speak to and they, they speak on, on the topic or whatever's alive. And then that listener reflects back their understanding until the speaker feels heard and understood. So they don't have to compete. You know, you're talking about competition in school. That competition goes into attention, competition for attention too, right? It's like, I got to fight and I got to struggle. I got to talk over people to, uh, to uh, be heard here and get attention. And here, you know, it's your space. It's your time to be heard and you'll be heard to your satisfaction. And we do put a time limit, you know, five, six minutes that you can speak. Uh, you share a little bit and then you get a reflection and then you share a bit more and you get a reflection of what you said uh, until your time is up or you're, you're complete. And then it becomes the listener's uh, turn to speak and they select someone in the circle to speak to and that person reflects back. And we just go around like that for the time allotted and this is uh, the same process that Rogers used, or you know, I'm sure you've used in your therapeutic process, but it just takes it out of the therapeutic process and puts it into more of a, a relational uh, process. And, and if you look at it, it's the core, just like in therapy, the being heard and understood is a, ha is a healing process. You know, is, is, you know, people have their issues and they get, they're able to share them and be heard that just the being heard by someone else creates a sense of connection, you know, that affiliation you're talking about. And that, you know, release of stress, anxiety, fears is very healing in and of itself. So uh, if you do that in a group, you know, that, uh, that process kind of plays out uh, in a group. And then that it's also the gate. So that it's the gateway for that supportive listening uh, process. But it's also core to conflict mediation. So if you've done any sort of conflict mediation, you bring the parties who are very angry with each other and you know almost don't really want to talk to each other, you bring them into an empathic empathy circle process. And then they start listening to each other and the dialogue goes around. And when people start feeling heard and understood, kind of the stress, uh, the, the, the resentments, they start melting away and, you know, there's this connection and sort of problem solving happens. So it's, it's the, it's the, this process I'd say is the, the gateway to uh, conflict uh, resolution as well. And if you're familiar with human centered design, uh, it's a design process that, you know, it's very much used in the technology field and it's where if you're designing any product or service that you really need to understand the impact that uh, it's going to have on the people you're designing for you need to understand the emotions that are coming up the the struggles or the joys or whatever the full spectrum of their felt experience to design products that you know, make a positive uh, impact on their life so again that listening is is core to 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 that process to uh, to, to that human centered design uh, process I think I, that's fascinating, Edwin. But and also this ability to hear coming back at you what the person has made of what you've said, because uh, as you know, in some conflict resolutions, that bit's missing. So yes, I can talk, but I but then you don't tell me. So okay, Paul. So I hear you. This is what you're saying. This is what you're feeling. This thing. So that feedback from the listener to show that person that they have and listened and understood i think that's a crucial element isn't it really yeah absolutely that just to know that the person has really listened Listen. is there's something and i think there's something in terms of uh empathy there's something about a synchronization that happens when we synchronize even in dance people get synchronized that there's a release of tension a release of uh you know the, the cortisol the stress hormone 
that I think it releases oxytocin that uh, counters that. So kind of from a biological uh, aspect that when somebody reflects back what you're saying and you you reflected back a little bit earlier, something that I was saying, and it feels good, you know, it's like, oh, he's really listening. It's like, it puts me at ease, you know, it's like, you know, Paul's really listening. So I feel more at ease. I feel more comfortable, you know, in, in this discussion or interview. And it's the same thing with, uh, yeah, when we, when we have these empathy circles, you, you get heard and there's a, that synchronization, that, that meeting, it, I think it releases oxytocin, which, you know, just is, uh, you know, so-called love hormone uh, and, and counters, you know, that stress, that uh, cortisol. Yeah, as you say, it gives a sense of um, of connection. So I think that's really what's what I love about the work is that you, you you're making this point that it's not just about understanding the other person; it's that the other person understands that you've understood. That that part is really um, very very important important therapy, but also, as you say, very important in conflict resolution, because sometimes in international conflicts they don't always do that. They they let people state their position. But then the other person states their position and you end up just stating positions, not actually showing that you've heard and understood people's positions. <laughs> yeah, it's a reflection part, I think, is yeah, like you're That's saying. Right. It's really, there's really in any conflict resolution um, that being able to restate, uh, I think, yeah, is really an important uh, added uh, component to it. And we've done conflict resolution. You mentioned the uh, empathy tent. So mm -hmm. this is a, a tent that we would take to uh, political rallies. And uh, for example, I live near Berkeley, California, which is a very liberal you know, hotbed here. And then conservative uh, would come and demonstrate. And then you'd have uh, the, the, the left, you know, Antifa and so forth would counter demonstrate and it'd be knocked down, drag out fights you know, here in the park. And we'd set up the empathy tent and offer to listen to both sides and then invite them to do empathic dialogue uh, with each other. And, uh, and, and I've seen it over and over again where that reflected reflection, like you're really hearing me. Now I know that you're really hearing me, you know, that that, that, that uh, is just so, you know, so powerful. And uh, it, it just brings the sides together. There, there's a documentary called Trump Phobia, what both sides fear. And they featured the empathy tent where we had, you know, they, they, they videotaped us, you know, facilitating mm -hmm. these dialogues between the political left and right using this empathic listening. And it, at one rally, we did six pairs, you know, one person from the left, one person from the right, I sat him down, we did the empathic listening for, you know, 45 minutes, an hour. And each of those ended with hugs between the participants. And on the other side of the streets, they were screaming and yelling at each other, you know, the two counter uh, demonstrations. So yeah, it just shows that it really does work. I think, you know, what you're saying is so important because we also have a to be honest, a media, particularly a right-wing media, who are not that interested in empathic connecting, they're more interested in stirring up conflict because then they can sell the blood on the carpet, can't they, really? And that that is an issue about how we can override some of the anti-empathy connecting processes in our society of not wanting to connect to the other, not wanting to understand the other. So I, I, I'm sure you, I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that, how we can because what you've just said is brilliant, really, about if you bring people together and facilitate this process, they end up with a hug. But if you don't, they end up with, you know, having their heads bashed in. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, I just thought I had there, I kind of had lost it. But uh, we, we we had done that with, uh, I just just one story that, that, that came to mind was, uh, you know, we set up the empathy tent in downtown Berkeley, and there was a group of right wing group that were protesting there. And actually, a, a several women from the right were sitting in the empathy tent talking with one of our, you know, one of our other members, team members. And then a Berkeley liberal came and she's a woman she says, I, I'm living here in my bubble and I never get to talk to conservatives. And I said, well, we have a couple right here. <laughs> And I said, let's have an empathy circle. And I sat both of them down to, the, you know, call one person over. 
and they started listening to each other. And then the topic was uh, gun control. And, uh, you know, I would do, the, do that empathic listening process that uh, first I listened to both sides, you know, just to sort of model the practice. Then I asked them to listen to each other. And someone, one of them would say something to the other person. And then the other person, instead of reflecting, they'd say, well, I don't really think, you know, I think something else. So they, they, they'd kind of get uh, defensive. I said, no, no, you'll get a chance to speak and be heard to your satisfaction, but first reflect back what you hear the other person say. And then they would do it and I'd keep them on track. So as a facilitator, all I'm really doing is keeping them in the process. And it turned out that, you know, they, they had so much more in common than they really knew, thought at first, because it turned out the conservative woman had had a distant relatives who had been killed in a Texas church shooting. There had been someone gone into a church, shot, you know, quite a few people there. And she, so she was really concerned about that, that issue as well. But it's just that if people get defensive, they, they put up these walls and then people get polarized through, through those walls. And if you can get people just to hear each other, reflect back what they the other person is saying, know that they're going to be heard uh, to their satisfaction, you know, that they're not going to be put down, they're not going to be uh, demeaned or, or so forth, uh, that they'll have a chance to speak, that it just sort of unravels the content, the, the, the disconnection, and a real sense of connection starts forming. And then once you have that connection, you can do problem solving. And the point I did want to make is, I grew up in a conservative, you know, evangelical environment. So I, I know that world. I started doing the traveling. I moved to a more progressive world. But I've now come to see that there's two sides to a conflict and neither the left or the right are virtuous in my sense. In, so you were sort of saying, oh, the, the right doesn't, you know, want that, you know, want to, they want to stir the pot. But if you're in the left's bubble it's it looks like that but from the, the right the, the left is doing the exact same thing you just don't they just don't see what they're doing you know it could be they're surrounded in self-righteousness like we care about people and they don't see that that self-righteousness is a block to seeing the humanity of, of what you know the other side what and, you know, being willing to dialogue. And a lot of times, you know, sometimes it's easier to have the political right be in dialogue than the left. You know, the left say, I'm not going to talk to those people. I'm not going to give them attention. And uh, it's very different than what we do. Like, we take, we've take we taken the empathy tent to political right-wing rallies where we're the only ones who are sort of in the liberal, you know, camp, I guess. And we're saying, hey, we're here to listen to you. You know, and we've had, I remember once we had uh, uh, five Identity Europa group. I don't know if you know them, but they were the ones that wore, wore the khaki shirts and had the tiki torches in Charlottesville, if you, if you remember that. So we had five of them come into the empathy tent. And there's this group, they were sort of Holocaust deniers. And one of our team members is, uh, you know, Jewish and uh, you know, the, the topic of the Holocaust came up and they were starting to get a little testy, you know, in terms of uh, their discussion. I said, oh, we do empathy circles here. So I brought the discussion into an empathy circle and the topic came up, what does the Holocaust mean to you? And uh, my friend said, well, the Holocaust means that, you know, my family who came out of Austria half of them were killed and the other half were spread around the world. You know, this is what it means. And for the identity Europa person, uh, he, he did not want to say that. He did not want to reflect that because his view was, you know, that was, you know, he had, he was, his view was, you know, the, the, it wasn't a real Holocaust. It was just fighting communists. And he just did not want to reflect. He, he kind of, you know, he, he, he said something, but that wasn't it. My friend said it again, the, He's the guy tried to reflect. He couldn't say it accurately. My friend said it a third time. And then the guy just couldn't reflect it because he, you could just see him in his head trying to spin rational, you know, arguments and stuff. And he said, you know, you, you're not hearing me. And then one of his, uh, the other uh, the five, 
uh, guys was there and he had been doing a little empathy circle with someone else. And he said to his friends, just reflect back what you heard him say, just say back what you heard him says, say. And then the guy said, uh, half your family were killed and the other half were spread around the world. And he says, yeah, you got it. And my friend, you know, he, he just, he could just feel it like the guy heard it. He, he took it on. He didn't have this wall, this filter, these rationalizations, you know, kind of in front of him. He heard it and took it on. And so, um, so I guess the, my point there is, is we try to bring all the sides into an empathic dialogue. We, we listen to them. We, you know, and then we try to have a mutual empathic dialogue and be non-judgmental. You know, it's like, you know, you will be heard to your satisfaction, but you listen to the other person too. So, uh, yeah, so I guess I, that was the point I wanted to make about the left and right that uh, I don't see a sort of a virtue on, on either side. I think both sides are not really valuing empathy. It's a, a much more compassionate position than the one I had. So thank you for the correction. Yes. Okay, so that's that, such an important uh, point that you're making, really, really important point that you're making. But that's quite a courageous thing to be doing as well. And that's also what struck me in some of the examples you've um, given us. And because for us, you know, courage is very important for compassion because without courage, you can want to do things, but you don't. So, you know, do you think that's a key issue too? How do you develop the courage to step into those which are potentially really difficult conversations? Yeah, for me, it, it I, I enjoy it. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. It's, like, okay. it's like a challenge. It's like, can I, you know, can I do it? It's like, you know, give me the tough, tougher, you know, situations because it, it's sort of a learning and growing experience. And yeah, I just uh, enjoy the, the challenge of it. But I, I will say that one of the toughest is in your family, right? <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've been talking for years with my family, you know, uh, you know, about empathy and they're like, oh, we don't know what the heck he's talking about. Doesn't make sense to us. And then it was like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, <clears throat> a uh, conflict happened <laughs> during Christmas um, between my sister-in-law and my mother. And, uh, you know, the, my mother had put uh, the uh, gifts for the children, you know, behind the chair, and they were sort of very accessible. The kids found it, and they started tearing everything, tearing into it, and it really upset my sister-in-law. She got really angry about it and started blaming my mother, you know, for putting it there. And then my mother said, don't you talk to me this way. And I mean, it was like things were really heating up and it looked like Christmas was just going to be, you know, everybody's going to go home like really angry. And I thought, well, I'm, I, I'm Mr. Empathy. Here. <laughs> I got to do something. <laughs> I got to do something. But I had such fear and anxiety, like deep in my body to step into this conflict. I remember you're you talking about fear it was like a, a fear and anxiety that was like in the marrow of my bones, you know, it's like just a tension, but I'd done a lot of empathy circles. So I also have that, that spaciousness, but I was holding both. Right. And then uh, instead of, you know, jumping in and say, you're right, or you're right. I said to my sister-in-law, Oh, I hear you're really upset that the children got into the gifts. And, and then, uh, did, did I hear you correctly? He says, yeah, that's right. And and you're really upset with, you know, my mother because she put the gifts there. So I just reflected back what she was saying until she felt heard. Then I went to my mother. And so you're really upset. I'm hearing you're really upset that, you know, she's kind of blaming you for all this. And so you're really upset with the, with the attitude she's directing towards you. Is that right? And so I listened to her and then I, you know, just went back and forth like that for, you know, maybe 15 minutes sort of reflecting both sides. And I'm like totally terrified <laughs> inside <laughs> too, that I'm going to kind of fall apart here. And then, but then they started, you know, they, the, the tension started going down, you know, when people start getting he heard, they, you know, the stress and tension goes down. And then I said, would you listen to the other person and reflect back? And then I kind of helped them you know, reflect back what they were saying to each other. And then all the family members who had 
been hiding like behind the doors, <laughs> they've been hiding behind the sofas, you know, the chairs, like, you know, they, let, let us out of this conflict. <laughs> they started coming into the circle and it turned into this big family empathy circle. So we went for like an hour having, you know, mutual dialogue, you know, and, and so I was kind of like mediating it, keeping it on track. And then it turned out that uh, my sister-in-law, you know, she didn't, she comes from a poor Russian family and my family were, she, she said, well, you know, you're more well-to-do. I feel like I don't really belong. I don't, I'm not really, you know, accepted in this family. And my father got up and said, uh, you know, I don't care about money. I, I just, I love you. You know, you've given us these wonderful grandchildren and just said this, you know, just really lovely accepting stuff. And they got up in the middle of the room and hugged each other. And that was like a turning point. And after that, you know, just a sense of connection happened. You know, my mother and her hugged. And so the conflict uh, came to a really beautiful resolution. And the last scene was my mother and my sister-in-law sitting on you know, a big fluffy sofa, kind of holding hands next to each other and, and, and talking. And then after that, uh, they... I say, well, this is empathy. This is what empathy is. And I said, oh, we get it. We see what this is. This is pretty good. And after that, we actually held some more family empathy circles. It was sort of like a breakthrough uh, in, in the family for kind of doing more empathic circles together. I think that's a, absolutely what, well, all, the, all of your stories have been wonderful demonstrations. But what also strikes me is how much those kind of dialogues facilitate compassionate relating you know they they are kind of like the fuel for compassionate relating aren't they because if you don't address those issues then that's when people get into conflicts and they become competitive and they have to win arguments and all that so as you know one of the reasons we're obviously interviewing you is because i i'm, I'm so impressed with the work that you've been doing and helping the people who are listening to this recognize that these kinds of processes you're talking about are absolutely crucial if we're going to be moving towards a more compassionate world. So that sort of takes me on to my next question, which is how would you like to see all of this wisdom that you're sharing with us today develop and spread? Yeah, the one thing you're, you know, you're talking about compassion, and I, I don't talk that much about compassion because there's kind of like seems to be different definitions of it. But if you're meaning compassion in that sense of deep warmth and care that happens, uh, you know that 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 is something that I'm I'm trying to foster too. That sense of intimacy, warmth, care, and in terms of conflict mediation, uh, it's like a, that doesn't even have to be there to begin with. It it's the uh, it, there's sort of a, a value of knowing through experience that if I can be empathic, if I can listen to someone that care and warmth can can uh, grow over time. So I don't know if that sort of makes sense. It's like, yeah, I mean, you know, in our model, we we have a um, an evolutionary model. So we have a slightly different model to some perhaps where we say there are two elements to compassion. One is the ability to be sensitive, to pay attention to suffering, to move in on it. And the other the other one is the ability to kind of work out what's going to be helpful. And both of them really require the kind of skill that you're talking about that if I'm going to move in to help somebody I, I need to understand what is causing their suffering what's it about what you know to hear their story about why they feel depressed or upset or whatever but I also need empathy in order to work with them so what would be helpful because I could just jump mm -hmm. in with my own ideas of what would right. be helpful, which might be not very sensible um so for us empathy is both important for the engaging with the suffering but also for the working out uh, what's helpful. Because if you only engage with suffering and you don't do anything about it, you get burnt out very quickly. And people often forget that empathy is essential for working through what's likely to be helpful because what's helpful for one person is not helpful to another. Yeah, I think that's uh, what I see sort of a, I don't, it's not a flaw, but it's a, it, the, the therapeutic model. There's a client uh, therapist model that you listen to the client and there's a, uh, you know, with Rogers model of just listening. And then the, the client 
through being listened to and heard, they start working through their problems uh, on their own. And I think that for me, the, that's only like half of the coin, like the, for, you know, like in the empathy circle, it's adding the mutuality aspect to it, where the, the client is also learning to develop empathic listening skills too. And so I think that that's, I see the therapy as kind of more like an emergency empathy, like people in deep, you know, deep distress and so forth. They need, they don't have the capacity to listen to someone, you know, they, they just need that uh, listening and, and uh, presence of someone else, which is healing. But then sort of the next step is that, that you learn is to listen to others. So uh, I think that's sort of missing in the client therapy uh, model and that we're sort of addressing in the empathy circle is that mutuality that's really important that you're, you're one, you're listening to the other person and you're also seeing the, the relationality of the empathy that it's a mutual. It's not like, hey, I'm gonna go listen or be you know, compassionate to the whole world it's that there needs to be a, a mutuality that it's it, we're in a relationship. We, you know, I'm willing to listen to you. I'm willing to, you know, develop care for your well-being. But then, how about it be reciprocal too? And I hear over and over again people say, "I do all the listening in my family. I'm kind of fed up with it because nobody's listening to me." Right? Yeah. I guess you could use it in your same model. I'm compassionate to the world, but the world's not compassionate to me. So there's something about that sense of, of mutuality. And I think that's what the empathy circle does is it creates that sense of mutuality that's missing, I think, from the therapeutic yeah. you know, framework. And that instead of, uh, um, like a lot of times I hear compassion is like seeing suffering and wanting to address it. And that can be just sympathy, right? That, hey, I feel sorry for you. I want to alleviate your suffering, but it's about me feeling sorry for you. Whereas with the empathy circle and the mediation model, there's a mutuality of a dialogue, a relationality to work through coming to solutions together. And that's sort of the, the, the uh, mediation model where the parties who are in conflict, that they talk with each other, first they get mutual understanding of, of each other. And then at that point, they, they say, well, what do we do now? And it's a mutual sort of an agreement, a negotiation. Like if you're in conflict, you know, sometimes it's like, well, let's get together once a week, you know, to talk about this. And then it's like, well, I can do it on Mondays at, you know, 10 a.m. or the other, I can't make it there. I can do this. And then what do we, how much time do we spend? So there's a sort of a, a mutual negotiation that happens. So I'm more interested in, in that mutuality uh, then like, hey, the world is suffering. And I got to do something about it. It's like, you know, it's like, it, this needs to be mutual, <laughs> basically. So I guess, yeah, that's that, that mutuality aspect, I think, is often uh, missing. No, I think that's right, particularly in uh, individual therapy, not so much in group therapy, because in group therapy, that's sort of what you should be facilitating people having the ability to listen to each other and so forth. But I, nevertheless, I think some of the things you've been talking about today and some of your training would really help therapists who are doing group therapy to do that facilitated listening better than perhaps we do so that's that's really important so how do you how would you like to see this develop because it, the only well so one of the drawbacks is that it's very practical you know you have to have the so how are you going to sort of spread this uh, <laughs> around the world <laughs> yeah it's uh you know it's 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 how do you spread it um it, it's a challenge because you're dealing we're dealing with a whole culture that has a you know certain value systems on you know we're constantly being taught that it's a competition the political yeah. left and right yeah. they're going to compete and it's all about power you look at a lot of the movies it's like the good and evil and you know they're going to battle it out, and 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 this is a very different uh, sort of a model, and uh, that that's sort of what I struggle with is you know the first thing is is the empathy circle. I just see it as something that's very reproducible. So you know technically, practically, it can be reproduced, 
and uh, if we can get high, you know, have the tools so that everybody can learn it and start their own circles. And, you know, people are doing empathy circles all over, all over the world and sort of spreading uh, that way. It's, uh, I can see that you can learn the process by observing it. So if we could have, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden do an empathy circle <laughs> instead of a debate, that would be that would be transformative. So a high profile person get Oprah Winfrey and maybe somebody she's in conflict with doing an empathy circle and, and modeling it. You know that you can learn it kind of one you know in small groups. But you can also um, see it modeled out in society, so it could catch on uh, that way. Uh, you know, I I ran for Congress, uh, you know, uh, with the empathy banner, you know, saying I this is where we, we. So I'm just kind of looking at every sort of way, you know, trying different things, see what works. Got three percent of the vote, so uh, in the primary, so that. Uh, didn't go too far, but you know, it got the word out that the mm -hmm. the, the handbook, you know, with the message about the need for empathy, went out to, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand voters. So they read it, and you know, it kind of stimulates them. So it's like an ongoing uh, effort. You know, if we can get into the schools and um, you know develop our training, kind of spread it. You know, do interviews, get the word out like like this. Uh, so it's it's kind of an ongoing. Oh, the, the thing I'm thinking of is what what we might need is a uh, sort of a you know for real movements. If you look at the women's suffrage, you know civil rights, uh, you know Black Lives Matter, you know the LGBTQ movements and other movements that they take to the street. Right, that unless you, that you have to take to the streets to to uh, get sort of the public attention to make the shift, and so one thing you know, I actually developed the empathy circle process from uh, being taking part in Occupy Wall Street here in Berkeley. You know, I set up the empathy tent there, and we offered listening, and then we did uh, you know sort of the talking stick uh, process in the empathy tent. And I thought that that didn't work too well. I started getting the idea for active listening. If if the whole camp of a couple hundred people were to do uh, empathy circles, I thought it would be a much more effective way to bridge all the divisions and conflicts that were in the camp. Uh, but before it could really implement it, you know, the, the police closed down the the camp. But I had thought that uh, so something like that, like an occupy empathy street level occupation of a space and we're not leaving until the politicians have empathy circles uh, with us would be it might be it's something at, at that level that's probably needed you know it to show that there's a real commitment behind it uh, to kind of capture you know people's uh, imagination and uh, and I'm I'm thinking of that in the future you know for like I could imagine uh, setting up the, uh, an encampment on, in front of Congress, like we have empathy tents there. We're not leaving until the Republicans, Democrats have uh, empathy circles, you know, between each other, and uh, you know to, to kind of push the push the edges, uh, something like. I think it's going to take something like that for a real cultural, you know, transformation, and it could be something. Um, you know, like you, we see what's happening in Iran now, that there's these, I could imagine that these protests tend to be like demonstrations, like there's you know, these demonstrations against authoritarian governments happen around the world. And, and they tend to be you know, like, you know, in Egypt, people demonstrate, they take over the public square and uh, they're sort of in conflict they're in a conflict demonstrative mode against the establishment, but could one of those demonstrations be about empathy circles? Like instead of that you take over a public square, but you sit down and everybody, instead of screaming and yelling at the powers that be, they say that we're gonna have empathy circles and you have several thousand people doing empathy circles in a square and you open it up 
to the, the powers that be. You tell the police, you're welcome. Come into an empathy circle. We want to listen to what you have to uh, say, as well as the, the, the political powers. So you don't go against them. You say, we're doing this em empathic dialogue, and we invite you into this, but you do take a, a public space. And I think the means are the end, so that if you do a like in Egypt, you know they they went against a an authoritarian system, and but they use you know semi-violent protest, and then they're they're sort of recreating. If you use the means of that kind of means, you, you know that movement fell apart, right? It became authoritarian, and then that authoritarian group was overthrown by the current government. So it's really about the the means uh, to transform a society so I, I have been looking at to connect with some kind of pro you know democracy groups that uh, uh, you know that we could do something like that if we could make that connection try it out you know prototype it uh, some somewhere to see how it would work and kind of yeah so th those are some ideas I you know it's yeah and it's, it's more of a street level yeah, yeah. you know protest but in an empathic way because the means are the end and yeah. as you know Joe Biden even said in one of his speeches he said uh empathy empathy is the fuel of democracy and you know I agree with that yeah I think there's an amazing ideas Edwin I mean I love your idea about staging empathy circles between two politicians I mean you'd probably get a couple of politicians not too distant from each other and then gradually work up to more and more and more but um I think that would be terrific you know if you could pull that off and actually do demonstrations of empathy circles with people who have very opposing views you know vegetarians versus meat eaters I mean there's a whole range of these conflicts um yeah that would be terrific really i mean the demonstration seeing it done recognizing how it's done and then people can practice it and they can have a go themselves you know but if people don't know about it and they don't know this is what we mean by empathy people just think empathy is all about just i uh, trying to understand you oh, i'm empathic do i can understand what you feel but what you're saying is such an important process but the actual process, the healing aspect of empathy is not just that. It's this act of listening, this act of reflecting, this act of being heard. That is what makes empathy healing. I think that's a brilliant message that you're bringing to the empathy um, world, really. Well, when I ran for Congress, the first thing I did is I reached out to the other candidates and said, let's have an empathy circle and how we can bridge the political and social divides and uh, there's five of us running for office, uh, uh, four Democrats and one Republican. Uh, two of the Democrats uh, uh, took part. They said, yeah, we will do it. We actually have a recording of that. And then the Republican was willing to take part, but the scheduling didn't work. And the establishment candidate didn't even respond. So that was uh, a little disappointing. And then somebody else uh, saw that, and then they did it in Nancy Pelosi's district, too. Oh, so uh, oh, they oh. set up an empathy circle. She didn't take part. She didn't respond. But uh, two of the other two of the four candidates who were running in Nancy Pelosi's district in San Francisco did it. So that is something that could spread that, you know, when people are running for office, they're kind of more open to something like this. So if there's anybody watching, that this is uh, something that you can do in your district. You can invite the candidates, you know, while they're running for office into an empathy circle to uh, kind of model this. And then in our local district here, um, we have our state uh, assembly uh, candidates running. And this was, you know, four, three or four years ago when they were running in our district. At UC Berkeley, we, we got a, you know, big hall. And we had uh, 11 of the candidates, there was 12 candidates running, and 11 of them came and did empathy circle uh, dialogues uh, with each other, you know, that, that I facilitated. And there's recordings of, of those too. So that is something that could be, you know, implemented. And there's always already a sort of a, a model for that. Uh, it could kind of go for any, you know, any election. That's, that's terrific. So we're coming to the end of our time now. So 
um, just to say once again, I think the work you're doing is really amazing. And if we can spread these empathy circles, that would be amazing. So I suppose just to ask you, so what would you like to leave our, our listeners with? I mean, obviously go and visit your website and there's trainings on your website. It's a fantastic website. And we'll show that again at the end of the talk. But are there any last thoughts that you would like to uh, say before we um, finish for the evening? Well, the main thing is to actually try it out. You know, to, you can listen to what we're saying here. Maybe that's a, a motivation or inspiring. But the best thing is, is really to, to do it. Uh, so if you go to empathycircle.com, there's the instructions for doing, uh, facilitating or taking part or facilitating an empathy circle. So just do it with your family, with your friends and, and uh, try it out and uh, uh, have that personal experience with it. It's, it's an easy enough process that you, know, you can do it without a lot of uh, training. And we do have a training to facilitate. You know, for, it's really for facilitating more difficult uh, empathy circles. So that's a five-week training. But the basics is, I think that's the strength of the process anyone can do it. So I really invite everyone just to, to try it out. Fantastic. Edwin, well, you've heard it from the, the man himself. Go and visit the website. Uh, look at some of the Empathy Circle instructions if you, if, you, if you want more instruction and try it out. And if we all do that, I think this will certainly move the world to a more compassionate place. Edwin, thank you so much for spending an hour with us tonight. And uh, I, I'm sure people will be visiting your, your website to find out more about it because you're, you've been an inspiration. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for this uh, invitation. It's always a delight to uh, speak with you, uh, Paul.